Welcome to the Enlighten Up Podcast, where I am going to take you into a deep exploration of what it means to exist in this current reality. We are going to raise your vibes, open your mind, expand your heart, and dive deep into the wondrous mysteries and possibilities of this lifetime. There's been a spiritual catalyst that has set in motion the awakening process of many across the globe to return to the knowingness of self and unite what has been separated. Together, we're going to bring light into that darkness. We're going to remember the joy of living. But most of all, we're going to turn up the volume of our own eternal power and do the thing we're here to do. everyone. Welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. Today, we're going to do a very interesting episode. But before I introduce you to my guest and tell you a little bit about her, I want to make a disclaimer here so that everyone understands how I feel about the carnivore diet. I know there's been some comments left in uh, the last YouTube video when I had Dr. Anthony Shafee on, which I thought was an excellent interview. And I really appreciate all of his information. And actually, that's how I found my next guest. But I want to say that I don't believe that there's any specific diet or way of eating that is right for everyone. I don't believe there's a right medicine for everyone. There's no magic pill. And I believe that we all have to do our own research and find out what fits for best um, for our solution, for our needs. And the reason why I'm putting this video out is because I think it could be very helpful to some people who are perhaps in this situation and it offers a potential solution. Okay, it doesn't mean it is the solution, it is a potential solution. And so although some of you may not resonate with this information, I want you to know that there could be someone out there who completely changes their life for the better. So know that I don't believe that, you know, that eating meat is the be all and end all of everyone's journey or that eating vegetarian is the be all and end all. I think we're all unique beings. Our genetics play a role. Our environment plays a role. Our stressors play a role. There are so many different facets. Okay. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to Allie Morgan. And she went from hypoglycemic overweight with polycystic ovary syndrome and Crohn's to full health. And we're also going to talk about her son's experience with the carnivore diet and going from nonverbal autistic to high functioning. So Allie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your story. I do believe it's going to help many. And I know that you've already helped quite a few people you've been, I guess, reached out to since doing some of these interviews. And I know you were recently on Sean Baker's, uh, Dr. Sean Baker, his uh, yeah. podcast. Yeah, I spoke I spoke with him and um, I was also um, with uh, Vinny Tortorich as well. Okay, I'm not familiar with, with uh, Vinny. Vinny does, um, he does the no sugar, no grains. Okay. Awesome. So, awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, you've had quite the health journey. And I do believe that part of the reason why you as a soul have perhaps chosen this very incredibly de- in-depth journey into health is so that you could help others with your story. I think that's yeah. part of the reason why many of us go through this. So your journey started right when you were a baby yes it did it did because at 18 months old I developed viral gastroenteritis and that turned into irritable bowel syndrome which stuck with me for the rest of my life and it was a miserable thing to deal with yeah that is not comfortable there is just I mean just eating anything is going to inflame and cause a lot of issues for you so how did your parents deal with that when you were a baby? Well, I, I was, I'm fortunate to have um, very loving parents. So that was great. And um, very, very intelligent parents. So they knew immediately they had to go find a solution. I was taken to a gastroenterologist at the time. There were years ago, uh, 
Dr. James H. Salisbury did a carnivore diet for gastrointestinal problems. He was using it for Crohn's disease and, and different types of gastrointestinal problems, but his work kind of got buried. And then around the 1930s, uh, Dr. Albert Rowe invented an elimination diet, which eventually became known as the Rowe rotational diet. And that was the diet that we were put on. Okay. Um, I have a sibling that also ended up with the same problems just from another situation. So we both were actually on the diet. And basically what it was is you would, you would eat the same thing all day long, every day for a minimum of, I believe it was four days, but you could go longer. And then if you were symptom free, you could switch over. And it was always basically a meat and a non-fibrous carbohydrate. So you'd start out with lamb and rice. And if you were good with that, for four days, or if you had to go a little longer and you were symptom free, you didn't have any reactions, they'd switch you over to chicken and boiled potatoes without the skin on it. And that, that was the basis of his diet. Okay. I believe using what's called the brat diet now for digestive disorders. And I think that stands for bread, rice, applesauce, and toast. Oh. <laughs> I mean, <100% laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. We were on the ro rotational diet. Okay. So you were just basically doing elimination and seeing what caused yes. it. So what were some of the flare-ups for you then? Um, different things. Uh, lactose, definitely a lactose problem. So, so dairy was a problem mm -hmm. for us. Um, certain spices just would trigger gastrointestinal response. And it was anything, sometimes it was super fibrous. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my dad's favorite cereals uh, is grape nuts. Okay. I would, I would try and eat grape nuts on occasion with him. And it would just, because it's so bulky with fiber, it would just destroy my gut. Okay. Absolutely destroy my gut. Yeah. And I, and I just didn't tolerate it. This is one of the issues I think that, especially when we're talking about people who are feel a lot better on a carnivore diet is mm. the fiber causes a lot of issues because it just bulks up and irritates the intestinal lining. Yes. And, 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 I, and I will say if, if you're not somebody who's willing to do necessarily carnivore, there's a very wonderful diet. And it's the IBS diet. And it was written by Heather Van Vuros. And she actually has a website and everything. She has all the information on her website. And it's not a full carnivore diet. But she she introduces you to the different types of fiber, the insoluble and the soluble fiber, mm -hmm. and explains to you how to eat for digestive disorders. Okay, great. And I actually ran across that a little bit later on after my first experience with carnivore when I had an issue. Okay. But that's another option for people who, who are not interested in full carnivore, because okay. I know it can be very restricting Yep. for some people. I don't feel it's restricting because it's just what works for me. Mm -hmm. But to me, what works for you and your lifestyle that makes you feel the best is what is the most important thing. A hundred percent. I'm so glad you said that. Yes. And so your and, and just let the audience know, like, how long have you been doing carnivore? I had my first start 20 years ago. Okay. Literally 20 years ago. And I was on it for a number of years. And then um, I, I got on it. Basically, what happened was later on, when I was four years old, I had to have... Um, my tonsils and adenoids taken out. And then I had to have tubes in my ears and everything. Everything was so inflamed. The only reason that we found out is because I was in preschool and Easter seals came in and did the hearing and vision test. And they called my parents and told them I was deaf because everything was so swollen. I actually oh could gosh. not, I was legally deaf. Oh my gosh. Well, it had to come out when the surgeon did the surgery and he had been a surgeon for a long time. He said, I had the largest adenoids he had ever taken out of a child. He said when he pulled them out and they puffed up, they were bigger than his fist and he had big hands. <laughs> do, do you know what caused that? What's what started all that? 
I, it's uh, some sort of inflammation in my body. Okay. And, you know, I don't know what to relate it to, whether it was the, the diet that I was on, whether I was already having some sort of possibly some immune issues at that well, point. In addition, inflammation seems to be the culprit, like of everything. Yes. It, inflammation does, does a number on a lot of people and, you know, there's, there's, and there's all kinds of inflammation in the body. And it can trigger different things. There's there's gut inflammation. There's neuroinflammation in the brain. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you have neuroinflammation in the brain, you're going to have any kind of psychiatric conditions going on. If you can bring that down, it's going to help. It may not perfect whatever you're experiencing, but it will reduce the symptoms. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Out. You're now like on the elimination diet, so to speak. You're you've just had your adenoids and tonsils kind of removed. You're four right. years old. Your health is now. You've gone through quite a bit now already. Um, right. What happens next? What happens next is I I start to develop severe migraines, just okay. very severe migraines. And I was only I was only about six years old at the time. And then they discovered because they were starting to be concerned a little bit about some psychiatric issues and they thought I was daydreaming in school. So they had me seeing a doctor and I started daydreaming in the doctor's office only for the doctor to kind of wave his hand in front of my face and tap me on the shoulder a little bit and turn around and look at my mother and say, she's not daydreaming. She's having a seizure. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I was having absent seizures. Wow. There, they were known at the time more commonly as uh, petite mal seizures. Okay. And then I didn't end up having a few grand mal seizures. So I was diagnosed with a form of epilepsy at mm-hmm. that point in time. And then I did, because of my, my grandmother's diagnosis, end up being diagnosed with type 1 bipolar disorder, dual swinging, rapid cycling. Oh my gosh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's like, if you could pick a type of bipolar disorder, that's not the one you'd pick. <laughs> what you makes it so different? That's like the one you really don't want. <laughs> Why is that? Like, what is, what makes it so different from regular? It, it's very difficult for doctors to treat. What the problem is with um, that type of um, bipolar disorder, and and I agree with um, a doctor who actually has it, and she's a clinical psychologist, and she wrote an incredible book. If anybody's interested, the book is called The Unquiet Mind, and she actually has bipolar disorder, and she's a clinical psychologist, and she wrote the book. It's her life story. It's incredible. Really? What, and how did, what did she discover through? Um... Um, she discovered a lot and I have to agree with her. It was originally called manic depression and okay. they changed it to bipolar disorder. And I agree that it should never have been changed to bipolar disorder because manic depression explains it much better because you have the manias and you have the depressions mm-hmm. and that really defines what the disorder is about. Okay. So you experience more of the the manic depression kind of uh, differences. And and when you are um, a dual swinger, you are somebody who can exhibit both mania and depression symptoms at the same time, which makes it difficult. And the rapid cycling, you can cycle in a day, you can cycle in a couple of days, or you can, you're cycling in a shorter period of time than the average person who doesn't have the rapid cycling, which can be six weeks or more. You can, you can literally cycle in one day. You, you know, I was ex- to depression. It's yeah. unbelievable. I was explaining this to my audience. I do a lot of, we talk a lot about energy and spiritual stuff on, on this podcast. Oh, yeah. And um, I was explaining to my audience a few weeks ago, especially during the lion's gate portal, like at the beginning of August, and there was a lot of astro- astrological alignments happening that were really creating a lot of disruption. And um, I said, you know, if you feel like you're at the same time, like, like there's some really happy high on life moments. And at the same time, you just want to cry and it feels like everything's falling apart. I go, that's, it's basically what a lot of people are feeling right now. And I'm realizing that's got to be what you're expressing right now. A yes. Feeling. 
Yes. And, and that was just constant. Oh gosh, that's exhausting. It, it was exhausting. And then they put you on all these medications and then these medications have side effects. So a lot of times you're taking a medication and then you're taking an additional medication for the side effects of the original medication. And it basically a non, like you can't get off the merry-go-round. <laughs> no. And a lot, it, most people are on a stabilizer and then you're on an antidepressant, you're on a sleep aid kind of thing. It's kind of what they did to Elvis. You know, they had him on an upper and then a downer and, you know, it really just blew him up <laughs> and wow. caused a lot of problems for him. <laughs> so, okay. So you're now realizing that you're having seizures and they've now diagnosed you as this bipolar, which is really should have been stayed as manic depressive. Right. So how many different kinds of medications are you on now? Like how old you're like six, seven years old and you're on all these different medications. I, yeah. I'm just on a, a boatload of medications and I, and I would react differently to different medications. So they were always because I was never stable. It was being changed up. I felt like a minimum of once a month I was going in and they were, they were adjusting a dose, adding something. And it was just, or taking something out and adding something else. And it was just ridiculous. I, I, I was, and pr I've probably been on every medication there is. <laughs> did you kind of feel like a lab rat in some way? I did. I did. I felt like a lab rat. Oh. I absolutely felt like a lab rat because it was like, okay, here, try this. Let's see what's going to happen because we don't know. Wow. Yeah. All of this at such a young age. Yeah. So, okay. When did things start to get better for you? Like when were, was the, when was there like your first turning point? My first turning point was actually when things went a little bit more south. Interesting. So, um, I do, uh, you did mention that I had the polycystic ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. and that was discovered when I was 14 years old. I had an emergency appendectomy and the surgeon found it during the procedure. He wow. found out that. Okay. Yeah, so you're a first. Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is unreal. Okay. This is so <laughs> much like trauma, physical trauma to be going through at such a young age. Um, right. So, okay, your appendix bursts, they go in to remove your appendix, and then they find out that you've got all these cysts on your ovaries. Yes. I was really grateful that he took the time to really look around in there because, you know, some, some are just, they, they, they focus in, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to insult any type of doctor or anything, but some just focus in, but he went in and he's like, I saw the one. So I went over and looked at the other, which is probably why you're a little more sore than somebody else would be because I was digging around in there. Okay. He wanted to know, he wanted to find the truth. And I appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So now, okay. So this is where things got worse and having all these cysts on your ovaries, which is a very painful thing for any man mm -hmm. out there <laughs> who's yeah. not aware. Uh, that's a very painful thing. I know um, I had a family member who had to have, um, I don't know if she had to have one of the ovaries removed or if it was just the cysts, but it was extremely painful and could have caused complications during a pregnancy. So it's a pretty yes. serious um, issue. What happens next then? So um, I was a little shocked to find that out because now I know that um, the cause of it is um, insulin. It's insulin resistance. Oh. And so I already had insulin resistance at 14, which to me was very shocking. Despite all my health problems, I was an athlete. And so I played sports and I was very lean and fit. And to look at me, you would not have thought that I had any type of problem with my blood sugar. But that's what causes polycystic ovarian disease. And what they would tell you was if you have polycystic ovarian disease, you need to watch to make sure you don't have problems with your insulin when it's actually the other way around. The insulin is causing the problem. I did not know that. Yes. I'm sure most so, people know. So after high school and I wasn't playing sports anymore, 
I had started gaining weight. And um, I was working in food service and I had had to have a physical to work in food service. They wanted to make sure you didn't have anything that would be contagious if you if you got caught or anything back in the in the prep area, basically. But I had an allergic reaction there and they took me over to the clinic where I had had my my physical to get treated for the allergic reaction that I had there. And having gained the weight, I was about 113 pounds in high school, 114 max. I was up to 186 at this point in time. And while I was in the clinic being treated for the allergic reaction, they pulled my chart out and they said, by the way, do you know you're hypoglycemic? And I went, oh, oh no. <laughs> that terrified me. And I'm just somebody, I don't like needles. I don't want to be around needles. I don't want to be stuck with needles. And I was like, I do not want to be diabetic. Now, the only thing that I knew was my uncle had had some pretty serious health problems. He had ended up having a quadruple bypass a number of years prior. And he was doing some sort of a diet where he had come off of his insulin for his diabetes. And so I reached out to him because I was like, if he could come off of insulin, then obviously I can get this hypoglycemia under control mm -hmm. with whatever he's doing, because that's major to come off of insulin. I, I agree. And I reached out to him and he was basically at that point in time, kind of explaining to me that he was kind of doing the Atkins diet. Okay. At that point in time. Um, in addition, I had a, a kind of a little secondary freak out because just right a few weeks later, I had gotten the results back from another test that showed I had a little bit of cervical cancer in addition. Oh, geez, girl. I totally um, understand that. Um, that's scary because I had um, I, I had abnormal um pap like tests like abnormal cells on the cervix when I was younger like when I went for my first pap test at 20 and mm -hmm. eventually when I was in my um early 40s uh just even just a few years ago I found out there were black spots and mm -hmm. that they're like you really need to get these tested now because I would assume mm -hmm. those are either precancerous um luckily for me through emotional healing, energetic work. Um, I was able to heal them within a year and they're completely gone. Wonderful. I'm so happy for you, but I know the fear. Yes. It is scary because it's attacking the area that makes you a woman. Yes. In fact, when I went in for the procedure, I didn't, I was so terrified of it. The doctor was pretty confident that he could keep, get it under control with the procedure and everything. I didn't even tell my family. I didn't tell my parents or anything that that's what the procedure was for. I was like, I did not want to tell them cancer. So I never told them. I didn't oh. tell them till later on that that's what it was. You're carrying a lot of burdens at this age on your own in some cases. And okay. And how old are you now at this point? I'm 23. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you've got a really big scare now. You're finding mm -hmm. out that you might have to be insulin dependent. Right. Um, you the cervical cancer scare on top of uh, all the other things that you've been dealing with. So yeah. what happens next? So I had reached out to my uncle and he was talking about the Atkins diet. In addition, um, he wanted me to read um, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, which is a very excellent book. It's worth reading. Um, if you don't know who Dr. Bernstein is, he's a type one diabetic. He's a doctor who's a type one diabetic and he developed his own diet to treat his diabetes. He's now, I believe, in his 80s. Okay. So he's doing well mm, on his own yeah. diet. <laughs> And so I started with the Atkins diet. And then my, my problem was, is that they, they had this carb limit 
of 20 grams of carbohydrates. And everything that was under 20 grams of carbohydrates was something that irritated my digestive system. Like what? It, it, it's basically kind of vegetables and stuff like that. And you can have a little bit of nuts and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, almonds or I know peanuts are not really nuts, but you know, you can eat some peanuts and things like that. But it it just irritated my digestive tract. So I actually got a hold of my uncle to see it's like, is there anything else that I can eat that's not listed in this book that I can eat to stay under the 20 grams of carbohydrates? And at that point, he told me he could not go over 10 grams of carbohydrates or he had to use insulin again. Really? Yeah. So I asked, I said, what are you eating? basically and so he kind of ran through his day and he was pretty much just eating meat he'd have an occasional salad or something there I thought okay he's just eating meat now I had actually learned about the Inuits in elementary school so Mm -hmm. I knew there was a culture that ate only meat and I had read something I believe it was in the National Geographic we always had the National Geographic I love the National Geographic (laughs) And I had, I had learned a little bit about the Maasai. So I knew there were cultures that were meat-based and that's pretty much all they ate was meat. So I wasn't too scared to go ahead and try it. Mm -hmm. The only thing that was sitting in the back of my mind was these cultures have been doing it for generations Mm -hmm. and they had been doing it since birth. And was there going to be something different about me doing it? Of course. I think it's a natural question to ask. Now, what's your, do you mind me asking, what's your genetic background? Like, um, because I, I think like more Northern kind of Scandinavian, European, um, or North American, like Northern, um, countries will actually do much better on higher meat diets. Yes, I have, um, quite a mix actually. I, I do have, um, some, some Northern, um, Scandinavian stuff. I have some Viking ancestry. I'm, I'm also Sicilian Italian, mm. and I have some because of the uh, Sicilian uh, background. I have some um, Saharan African as well, and then some of my family is Greek, and they're from uh, Cyprus. Okay, so I have kind of a Next. interesting, and I do have some uh, German in there as well. Okay. So kind of like the Viking Scandinavian and some Mediterranean uh, mix in there. Okay. All right. So your, your uncle's only doing 10 grams of carbs or he has to go back on insulin. How long has he been doing that for like at this point? He had been doing it for a number of years at oh. this point because he was, he was trying to find an answer. Um, he had gotten remarried and had um, a set of twins. So they're, half my age basically so he's like he has these young children and he wants to see them grow up obviously so he's at the point where he's I really have to take care of myself yeah and so it really hit him okay and so he worked really hard to find the solution and I was grateful that he did because that was the only way I could find my solution Mm mm-hmm so how did you start incorporating the meat? Like what meats did you start with? Or like, did you kind of just, were you really kind of scared to just like, what was it like for you in the beginning? In the beginning, I just kind of went with it. It's like, I just kind of went with some of the classic foods for things for breakfast. It's there's sausage and eggs Mm -hmm. and some butter and stuff like that. Classic breakfast. Sometimes at lunch, obviously they're, they're, when you look at the carnivore diet now, people are very strict. They, they're, they're eating chicken. They're eating just beef and stuff like that. I, w- I would grab some lunch meat. <laughs> it's not the best. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing and yeah. I didn't know that there were carnivore communities and stuff where there were resources of people that could help you. <laughs> I didn't know. And then a dinner would be whatever the, the meat, um, the, the chicken, the, the beef, whatever it was. Well, this was 23 years ago, right? 
the, the, it was tw- 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Well, this is just when the internet's just kind of coming in and we're starting to yeah. discover how to use it. And Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not like today where you just, you could pick up your phone and say, Hey, Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I hope I'm spelling this right because yeah, it may or may not show up. Yeah. Facebook <laughs> wasn't even around. There weren't Facebook no. now- none of that yet okay so you're kind of like just going at it that you're alone other than thankfully you had your uncle to kind of lean on yeah okay yeah so I went with it for a long period of time and then I ended up falling off of it uh I had moved in with my grandmother okay wait before you before you go into that story so you started did you start to notice any healing symptoms um or healing benefits it was, it, it, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And I'm so glad you backed me up. When I, I was doing Atkins and so I was doing low carb, but when I made that transition to full carnivore within three days, I, I was, I was almost literally in tears. I hit what they refer to as the zero carb is in. And I literally looked at a friend of mine and I said, I feel like for the first time in my life, this is what normal is supposed to feel like. Because I felt calm. I felt peace. I was sleeping. I didn't have insomnia. I went to see my doctor. They started pulling me off of these heavy duty medications. And it was just, it was this, this inner healing. All within three days. Yes. That's incredible. And I just want to say again to the audience that if this is the healing effect for some people, when they stop eating carbohydrates and they're simply eating animal protein, I mean, there's got to be something to it, you know, to, to deny that for whatever the reasons are, whether it's you know, you're an animal lover, or maybe it's like your idea of what's protecting the environment, whatever it might be. um, You can't deny someone's own experience. And I'm an animal lover. (laughs) Yeah, I am too. I am too. I I, I love animals. I, you know, it's like, I I eat steaks, but I also, you know, I can go up and hug a cow because I think they're cute as can be. (laughs) So yeah, yeah. There is somewhat of a conflict, but <laughs> so, okay. So you're, so three days in, you're already, you're feeling, I love that the zero carb Zen. <laughs> yeah. That's what they call it. I didn't even know it was called that because that was the original term. Apparently Dr. Sean Baker kind of came out with the general carnivore okay. diet okay. because that's obviously if you're eating meat, you're a carnivore. <laughs> so it makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know when, I think he was the first person to actually just say carnivore. There, there's lots of uh, different terms, but of course, realistically, if you just look at it, it it is, you are a carnivore if you're eating meat. (laughs) So you continue to do this then for Mm -hmm. several years before you kind of came off it, which we'll get into in a second. So was there any other health benefits that you started to see build up over those years? The, the, you know, the weight came off, um, the hypoglycemia went away. Um, I, I, I've been cancer free since. That's a big one because yeah. everyone tells you like, I mean, it's a general kind of statement. It's not specifically said, although I think sometimes it actually is, is that eating meat causes cancer. That's told I've- to us all the time. And I, know that, I know I know that I thought that there were so many times where I used to think, oh my God, if I eat too much meat, I'm going to get cancer in like the gut or like the, the uh, colon cancer, colon cancer. They tell you is like a cause of eating meat. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So there are, there is definitely some sort of healing impact that when some of us humans, not, I'm not saying all, but some of us humans go back to eating a, um, a meat only diet. So there's a very healing effect here of animal protein Mm -hmm. and not, I should say also not having perhaps a lot of fiber, uh, or anything that could cause, I guess, 
sugar um, imbalances. All right. Okay. And 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 one one of the other um, um, big things that I, I like to know with people because I know there's people that have had success on other diets, and, and a lot of it is just you're going back to eating real whole foods. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, you can do uh, a carnivore diet where you're just eating lunch meat and salami and, and things like that. And that's not no. that's not healthy. You can be a shitty meat eater and you can be a shitty vegan at the same time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but if you're somebody if you're you're a vegan and you're eating um, you're eating vegetables, you're eating natural vegetables and things like that and fruits and all this stuff. And you're not eating chocolate chip cookies, mm-hmm. that kind of thing you're, you're going back to eating just real whole foods. Yes, I agree. And so you're getting nutrients that you were not getting before. Mm -hmm. So you've lost a lot of weight, your Mm -hmm. blood, your, your hypoglycemia is gone. Okay. The cancer is gone. Yes. This is big. So, but you fall off of it. So take us through what, how that happened. That happened. Um, I moved in with my grandmother to take care of my grandmother. She had been diagnosed with dementia and she had gotten to the point where the doctor said she just can't live by herself anymore. Just because it was so bad. They, they had this fear of her falling, uh, level of concentration, her focus, just her mental capacity at that point in time. And, and it slowly started to really kind of go downhill. And then the last year of her life, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Mm. So she had dementia and ovarian cancer. And at that point I was just a wreck because I was her live in caregiver. And that's a lot of stress fell off of it. And of course there were certain things that she wanted to eat. And then when she started her chemotherapy, it was just anything that we could get her to eat was great. And so I would fix her something just to try and get something in her. And I was like, okay, <laughs> and I just put it in my mouth because I was exhausted Yeah, at that point in time, because it was, it was 24 seven. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't like I was going into the home and taking care of her and then leaving. Like it was a job. I was with her 24 seven. Yeah. So it's just a lot of emotional stress you know, physical, mental stress, like yes. all of that p- compounding, um, and, and lack of time. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was a lack of time. And, um, the unfortunate thing with that too, is because I went off, I also had to go back on medication. Okay. That I had come off of because I was now not, I didn't have that same level of healing and stabilization within my mind and my body that I had had prior. Mm -hmm. So now you're starting to see how sensitive your body is to your diet. Yes. And how important and integral staying within a certain frame of eating is for you and your health. Yes. And, and one thing that I, I always tell people, you, you have to think about this. We, we always talk about environmental factors. Mm-hmm. That's an external substance that you're putting in your body. So your diet is technically an environmental factor. It is. Yeah. And it falls under that category. What, what kind of were you going through when you started to feel like you started to realize, oh my gosh, I'm going back on meds. Like what was kind of going through your mind and just emotionally, what were you going through? It was, it, it, it was very depressing because I, you know, I was watching her decline. I knew she was dying mm-hmm. at that point in time, because she had the dementia. She didn't actually even understand she was dying. Okay. And so that was a whole different thing. So there was a fight in her that was unbelievable. (laughs) And, you know, I'm sitting there. I was like, okay, I'm watching my grandmother die here, basically, and caring for her. And now I'm I'm back on these meds. At one point, it, it did feel a little bit comforting to have some of the meds. And then it was like, oh, my gosh, now I'm taking the sleep aid and 
it's making me drowsy and the sleep aids always made me hungry mm -hmm. gave me cravings and then I wake up in the morning and you don't actually really if you're taking a sedative you don't really wake up in the morning you just kind of it's more like you're coming out of anesthesia <laughs> and it takes a little bit it's kind of a I need an entire pint of coffee <laughs> to get out of this kind of thing mm -hmm. so although it was helping some it was frustrating to know that I was taking these meds again that I had gotten rid of and, and part of it too is that anything that you put in your body any of these medications you put in your body and I've known this since I was little it everything's processed through your liver and it damages your liver and the last thing I wanted to do was just damage my body having to take medications when before it was like okay I had come off of these medications and I was having just this tremendous healing so how long did it take for you to finally choose to go back to what worked for you well what actually happened was after my grandmother had passed um I found what I was originally diagnosed as a pilonidal cyst and I had to have a surgery for it and six weeks after the surgery, the surgical site ruptured open. And at that point in time, my mom contacted my aunt, who was a nurse. She was the aunt that was a nurse that lived closest to us and said, we want a different surgeon. You know, who would you recommend? Because she kind of knew everybody. And so I went to a new surgeon. He had to clean out the wound and I had to heal from it first because I had actually contracted MRSA at the hospital where I had the first procedure. So I had MRSA in the wound. What's MRSA? I've never heard of that. It's, it's a staph infection. It's, oh, staph infection. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a form of, uh, it's, yeah. It it's sounds a to me. Resistant staph infection. Okay. And it sounds to me like clearly your immune system and your body's ability to heal itself is drastically impacted when your diet changes. Yes. It, it, it was very compromised. Okay. So he, he had cleared that out and then I had this, the procedure repeated and then it ruptured open again. And now he was a really, really good surgeon. He wanted to get to the root of the problem. He wanted, he wanted to fix me mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. And so he started asking me some questions because he was really looking at the wound, the canal that the wound had and everything. And at that point in time, I told him, I said, the past few years, I have had the worst irritable bowel syndrome flare that I have ever had in my life. And he said, mm, that's kind of interesting. So what he did is he sent me down the hallway and it was literally down the hallway to a colleague of his that was a gastroenterologist and they did an endoscopy and a colonoscopy on me and it wasn't an irritable bowel syndrome flare. I had Crohn's disease now and that's what he was doing surgery on. It was an external Crohn's fissure, which is why it wasn't healing because I had Crohn's. Oh, so it wasn't a cyst. No. Wow. I'm just grateful he caught that. Yeah. But now at this point in time, I'm on bed rest. And now because I have Crohn's and they have to treat this mega Crohn's flare, I'm being pumped full of some of the worst steroids that you can think of, because that's what they have to put you on. They have to put you on these mega steroids to treat it. So I'm on complete bed rest. I'm being pumped full of steroids. I can't take care of myself. The wound stayed open for 18 months. 18, a year and a half? I was on bed rest with an open wound for 18 months. And by the end of these 18 months, I weighed 265 pounds. My goodness. And at that point, I kind of had a little pep talk with myself. I kind of hit rock bottom because I thought to myself when I weighed less than this I was hypoglycemic for all I know now I'm diabetic I have an open wound that won't heal I said something is going to kill me 
and I need to find what the answer is. I need to heal. And that's when I, I got on the internet and I found Heather Van Burroughs' diet, the IBS diet. And I started with that. And it was very similar to what I remembered as a child of Dr. Rowe's rotational diet. It was a similar concept. My concern was, was the level of carbohydrates because I had an understanding of the carbohydrates and the insulin. Mm -hmm. And even though I was feeling better, I did the diet for a number of weeks and my, my stomach was feeling better. My guts just kind of went, Thank you. <laughs> because I was feeling better. I was just concerned about the carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in time, I was, okay, I'm learning from her that fiber is the enemy of the gut, especially if you have digestive disorders. And that made sense from Dr. Rowe's rotational diet. It was a, you know, it was a starchy carb. It wasn't a fibrous carb yeah. that we were eating. And I said, okay, so what can I do that doesn't have fiber, but also doesn't have carbohydrates? And then I thought, well, let me just go back to eating the meat. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing that, the gastrointestinal problems went away even more. I started coming off the steroids and that's when the wound started healing. And I was losing weight. I lost a lot of weight very quickly. And that's not always something that I tell people, but I lost 90 pounds in a little less than five months. Wow. That's almost, that's like 18 pounds a month. Yes. I was losing about a half a pound a day on average. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was healing again. I was, my body was healing. I'm, I'm getting this message to say right now, and I know some people are going to be triggered by it. And I'm just going to say, I send a lot of compassion to you for the trigger. Um, but I feel like tissue heals tissue. Yes. Mm. It does. You, you have, you, you have to reduce the insulin to heal. And, and the, the interesting thing was, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to put anybody off in any way, shape or form, because I'm not, I'm not against anyone who does any other diet mm -hmm. and, and people have very good reasons for doing other diets. But I do know of some surgeons that can tell you when they're operating on a vegan, because they say the tissue is gray. It's not pink. Gray. It's gray. That's the color of decay, death, like the life force is out of you. Yeah. You know, this is, and I, I, this is really interesting because, um, wow, I did not know that. And, when, and I know, and I, ha I have relatives that are, are, are vegan and they, they look perfectly healthy. <laughs> you know, I'll say this. I, and I, and I want people to, cause I've, I've been a vocal about this on my podcast in the past. I was vegetarian for a couple of years. And I remember in the first six months to a year, I felt great. I felt great on it. Like I was so happy I did it. Um, just my body responded pretty well. Most of it, there were some things I was kind of not paying attention to. Like the fact that my hair was breaking and my nails weren't as strong, but overall though, I felt really good. I felt light. I felt clean. And I thought, yeah, no, this is working for me. But then I realized I'm losing muscle. I'm not, I don't, my energy levels aren't as great as they used to. I'm starting to have more digestive issues than I've ever had. And I will say that I started to notice aging a lot faster than I've ever noticed. And of course, and I kind of just chalked it up while well, I'm in my forties now, I guess this is just something that happens, but then I would catch myself. I mean, Nicole, you, you've never thought like that before. And I will say, I want the audience to know that since I've been eating much higher um, animal protein now, I'm not a full, I'm not full carnivore. I would say I do about 70% um, animal protein right now uh, because I'm a carnivore. That's, that's what you're, um, adjacent carnivore. Is that what it's yeah, called? Carnivore, 
Yeah. Do, yes. Uh, Dr. Baker refers to it as carnivore adjacent. I prefer that term because hyper carnivore sounds like the very extreme people to some yes, people. Yes, it does. Like the salt and water people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and so, and I'm finding that it's working very well for me. In fact, I'm noticing that my skin and like my face is starting to plump up more. I'm losing actually certain wrinkles on my face that I had, I've had for a few years. And I'm like, oh. something's happening on top of that my skin on my body is getting stronger and um, much more plump. Like uh, where I had like a little bit of sagging um, and I was like, oh, I guess, and I, I've seen it on my mom. Um, so I'm like, I guess this just runs in the family. And now all of a sudden it's all gone. It's all firmed up. And I'm like, something's happening here. My body is reversing its age. It's healing through actually incorporating a lot more animal protein. And so I do this because not, because it's going to work for everyone. But I think right. it's important for us to have all the information and you can do whatever you feel compelled to do with it, whether it's trash it, like forget about it, never do a thing with it. Or maybe you want to look into it and explore it further. Or maybe you've already started this way and you want to go deeper into it. It doesn't matter to me. I just think it's important for us to have the information out. So that's really fascinating that surgeons have said the tissue is gray when they work on vegans. Yes. Uh, one of the other things, and, and I've discussed this kind of in groups, we, you've seen, you see this discussion in groups, and it's kind of usually when there's a group of females on the side, mm -hmm. that they will tell you something that they notice is that when they start to go more heavy meat based, or even full carnivore, their varicose veins start to go away. <gasps> oh, yeah. that's something I've noticed. I'm so glad you said that. I have noticed I have a varicose vein in particular that has started. It started to become pronounced when I went vegetarian and now I'm noticing it's going down. Mm -hmm. And, and, and a lot of people, the, the hemorrhoids as well go away, which, which is actually kind of, if people actually know what a hemorrhoid is, it's, it's basically, it's a varicose vein in the colon, in the rectal area. That's basically what it is. Okay. So this is probably TMI for my audience, but I'd say everything. I don't care. I think it's important that we talk about this stuff. So I started, right. to, I started to have that issue when I went vegetarian. Only when I went vegetarian, I started to have that issue. It started in 2018. And I believe I started vegetarian in 2017, I believe. And, um, and I, it, it would happen like once a month right? Uh, usually around my menstrual cycle. And I was like, Oh my God, what is going on? Like, this has never happened before. And I have not had that issue for uh, a few months now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been noticing it. I'm like, again, monthly cycle, no problems. I'm like, wow, on top. Oh, I will. I will say this too. My monthly cycle is lengthening. Mm -hmm. When I went vegetarian, I used to have a cycle of, I want to say 29 to 33 days, like somewhere right. in there. And it fell down to 25 days when I went vegetarian. And it's that, that, to that does up. happen to people. Mm -hmm. And now I just had my first 29 day cycle and I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. I'm only, but I've only been doing this for almost two months now. Like I've incorporated, started incorporating more and more animal protein. So I mm -hmm. think it's just important to talk about these things and, and observe them because what we actually experience in our real lives is I think what's most important. And yes. if, if it's healing for you, then you should keep doing it. And it doesn't matter if it's in contradiction to what we're talking about. If it's working right. for you, go with it. But I think this is where we have to keep an open mind on um, all the information that we're gathering. And, and, and that's one thing that, I, you know, I, I always tell people, um, I, I recommend kind of basically the same way that um, Dr. Baker does. Try it for 30 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. If you feel great, stay with it. If you want to incorporate other things back, go ahead. But whatever works best for your lifestyle and, and makes you feel the best mm -hmm. is the right thing for you to do, yeah. whatever that is. Like I if noticed you, I you have energy during the day, you're sleeping well at night, your skin looks good, you're happy, you know, your emotional state's good, then you're doing what's right for you. Exactly. I think that's 
I, well said. And I think that's, that's the barometer that everyone should be using. Yes. And, um, you know, I think what we, there's so many different diets and information on telling us what's healthy, what's not healthy, what's going to cause cancer, what's not going to cause cancer, what cures cancer, what, you know, like all these different things. There's so much information out there. And of course, you know, you just don't know what to believe anymore. But I think when those of us who can share what's working for us um, and people listen to a variety, and I think this is why it's so important to have a lot of different kinds of conversations around this so that we get all the different um, perspectives and possibilities of the healing journey. Yeah. And, and it was very shocking to me that that's what healed me because growing up with the health history that's, you know, in my family, you know, diabetes, heart disease, these kind of things, I, it was shocking to me that meat healed me because I always knew fruits and vegetables are super good for you. Yeah. And you, that's what you have to eat. And you need fiber and you need, you know, low fat and all this stuff. And and it was just, okay, don't eat a lot of meat. And this is, that's what was healthy. And the opposite is what healed me. Mm -hmm. The opposite of what I knew was supposed to be true was what was healing me. So there was that level of con internal conflict with me to just eat all this meat in the beginning as well. Yeah. Because well, I'm looking programming that we've no way that this is right. There, there's no way not having any vegetables on my plate. There's no way not having some fruit. Is this? There's no way I'm not getting the nutrition. What no. happens when you try to incorporate fruit into your diet? Like, have you tried ever to try to incorporate it? Like, is there anything that you can, or do you have to absolutely stay away from it? I really absolutely have to stay away with with it, um, but um, I did notice that I, I do a little bit better digestive wise with fruits than I would with a vegetable. Mm -hmm. I can't even iceberg lettuce can shred my gut. But if I had a little bit of watermelon or something, it wouldn't shred my gut. Okay. Okay. So to me, the first thing that disrupts is my intestines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this now since you um, healed, you know, you since he realizing, okay, the wounds now closing and all that, how long has it been since then now that you've been like eating this way? Well, I, I did that for a while and then I kind of went off of it and I was more, I, I was probably eating a, a little bit more hyper carnivore, mm -hmm. like probably a little bit more 80, 70, 80%. Um, during my pregnancies, because I, I still hadn't found any of the groups to give me resources where people had gone through like Kelly Hogan, for example, that was full carnivore through all of her pregnancies. And She's great. And um, she feeds all of, she, she feeds her babies, her kids, like just meat, like gave them meat. And it's incredible yeah. listening to how they're not experiencing a lot of things that um, kids will experience when they're having a lot more carbohydrates in their diet. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I was a little concerned still then because, uh, you know, like I said, the programming, I the programming is so ingrained in us. Right. And I knew, like I said, I knew about the Inuits and stuff like that, but I still in the back of my mind, I'm, I have my family wasn't doing this for generations. I wasn't on this diet since birth. Do I need something extra? Yeah. Because the last thing I wanted to do was to harm my child. Of course. But once my last one was born, I was, I, you know, I, I was, I was pretty much full carnivore towards the end. And then when he was born, so it's been five years again. Okay. Well, let's talk about your child because we've already, I can't, we've, we spent so much incredible time listening to your story. I know it's going to be helping so many people because we've talked, we've covered a lot of the, here's what's yeah. so beautiful about your journey is that it covers a lot of different health issues that not like someone might have one of those or two of those and none of the rest and realize, oh, maybe this is something I need to look into. So, I mean, it's, it's shitty for you as a, as someone who have to go through all of them, but you can actually help so many people in a variety of different ways through your story. So yeah. you now have, how many children do you have now? Three. Three children. Okay. And 
one of is, is it your son who is um now he's high functioning autistic yes okay he's, he's very he, he's pretty normal he does have a little bit of setbacks here and there yeah he's a toe walker so he's in physical therapy and so he has a little bit of occupational therapy but he's pretty normal otherwise and t tell my audience share with my audience um what happened because you there was an episode that reverted him to nonverbal. Yes. Um I was eating the diet myself. And so what I and everybody usually gets a kick out of it because I was eating it. I didn't have anything extra really in my household. Yes, I I made biscuits and stuff for my children, but they were pretty much eating what would have been the standard American diet from over a hundred years ago before mm -hmm. there was all these like processed foods and all these you know, bad chemical seed oils and, and all this stuff. So they were pretty much eating kind of a natural diet and he had the autism. You could, you could see it, but you know, I, I had hope for him. I was like, he's going to need special, you know, special education, things like that. And what happened was I finally found the carnivore groups. And the only reason I did was because I was following keto doctors because I didn't know where I belonged. And then Dr. Ken Berry decided he was going to try carnivore. <laughs> and that's when I first realized there were a bunch of other people doing this. Okay. I, thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of my uncle and I and the Messiah and the Inuits. Basically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. But the, you know, this is like, you know, I, I totally relate to this. And I know my audience is going to relate to this. There's so many times you just feel like you're alone in your own yes. like, things that you are like tapping into or things that you believe in or are really interested in. No one understands it and you can't talk right. to anyone about it. And so you feel really alone. So now you've mm -hmm. kind of found a bit of your tribe. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, I, I, that's why I, I said, I found my people. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was a beautiful experience. It's like, I found my family away from my family, <laughs> kind of my, my new family. And I went to uh, a meetup that uh, my friend uh, Marcy arranged. And I actually, uh, Kelly Hogan attended that one. She knew Kelly. Okay. So you've so met guess, Kelly in person. I've met Kelly in person and Kelly is a sweetheart. She's mm -hmm. truly a sweetheart. And it was a lot of fun. But um, I had left my my two oldest, which included my autistic, with my parents, and they stayed with them just a little bit longer because I they they went to their house and stayed with them a little bit before I left, a few days before I left. How interesting that this happened while you were going to a meetup for the carnivore yes. diet. This is that's so synchronistic. I know it's really strange. So my mother's trying not to bother me. Mm -hmm. but my parents were still, they were using margarine. They were, you know, canola oil, all this stuff. And you know, it's grandpa and grandma. You want some juice. My, my dad, I jokingly would call him the waffle King because I, even when, uh, when we were little, that was one thing he'd do on the weekends. He would make pancakes or waffles for us. And that was his like special little thing. It gave my mom a break. Um, but he would do that for my my children. He got one of those Belgian waffle makers. So he was like, I'm on this, <laughs> you know, waffles, waffles, waffles. And they love waffles. <laughs> and when I got back, he was melting down. Now, obviously, when you have a child, you know, his special needs, you can kind of see it's like, OK, I thought it was maybe a little bit more extreme because he had been with them so long and he loves my parents. And it's like, okay, now we have to leave grandpa and grandma okay. he's understanding that he's leaving. But it was a little bit different because he was just like whining and grunting and stuff like this. I had to sit him in the floor. He's, he's almost four years old. I'm putting his shoes on and I pretty much had to carry him out of the house and put him in the car. And then when we got back home, I got him out of the car and he slumps kind of back over in the floor and he's grunting and whining again. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? I get his shoes off of him. And the next thing I know, you know, everybody's excited. We're home. You know, my daughter, my daughter's the oldest. She's 16 months older than him. And 
it's just kind of a hyper situation. And he starts like smacking his ears and he's rocking and he's grunting. And I'm like, what is going on? And he starts kind of smacking his head kind of at the floor a little bit. And I rolled him over and I'm calling his name and his eyes are rolling around in his head like this. He can't even focus on me. Oh my goodness. And he's just grunting and smacking his ears. And I'm like, I mean, he just shut down and I knew what it was. It was registering with me, but I was just ready to cry at this point in time. I'm like, he's gone nonverbal. And so I knew I had to get it quiet in the room because I knew he was hyper stimulated mm -hmm. and just trying to get it. And then he was still just out of it. He was completely out of it. Couldn't look at me, couldn't communicate with me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where's my, where's my kid? He's, he's not in there where, mm -hmm. but he's gotta be in there kind of thing. And then I just thought back from all the research that I had done and what I had known, my first thought was, I, I know I can get him back because I know what he was before. Mm -hmm. And I know this had to be what they were doing because I know what they were eating was against everything that I knew that they should be eating. And what they were feeding him was against everything I knew he should be eating as well. So even though what I was doing wasn't necessarily perfect, my son beforehand could talk to me. And now he can't. He can't even make eye contact with me now. This has got to be so frightening. It, 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 was, it was terrifying. I, I spent... 20 minutes just melting down and just sobbing my eyes out because I didn't know how long it was going to take to get him to recover. Mm -hmm. I knew I at least had to get him into ketosis to shut the insulin response down because I knew it wasn't definitely at least an insulin response. And if I could at least get that down, but I knew that could take 48 hours before that even kicks in. Yeah. And it did. It took about three days. And of course, then I also knew I had to get a hold of the doctor because I knew I had to talk to the doctor as well. I'm like, the doctor's got to see this. The doctor's got to know mm -hmm. how bad this is. Right. And he slowly started to come out of it more and more. I had taken him full carnivore. Pretty so what much. Were you, what were you feeding him? Just so the audience knows. Um, it was full carnivore except one keto treat. I was making the only thing that was not an animal based product. I had been following Dr. Eric Berg and I made his chocolate chip cookies. I made some little tiny chocolate chip cookies and that was kind of their reward at the end of the day because I just put the whole family on the diet. Okay. Because I didn't want to try and isolate one child. I'm like, let's just do this. Good move really good move it was just the easiest and so i went and i i i fixed his favorite foods i kind of stuck with a lot of his favorites he liked eggs and sausages and things like that so we stuck with those for breakfast and he he was a, he loves chicken that was that's one of his favorite meats so i, I made him a lot of chicken i was also cooking other meats too for so that people could have some sort of variety mm -hmm. but he really started to come out of it and then the thing was, is that when he came out of it, he came out of it even more. Things that I was told were going to be delayed were suddenly happening. When you say things that were going to be delayed, are you saying before this all happened, like things that were before going to be delayed? This all happened. You know, we, we knew that he, you know, he had the autism, he was special needs. So we're looking at delayed on things like uh, certain uh, coordination, certain speech development, you know, milestones and things like that. Childhood okay. milestones. So before you went training. to your parents, all you were told a lot of this stuff is going to be delayed. So before this episode even happened, you knew. And so now he's starting to break free of those delays. Those delays. Literally 27 days on the diet, he potty trains himself. That's wild. 
I, just, like, I get I get chills every time I hear you say that. Like I I it's 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 what? just wild. I couldn't believe he did it. And it was just it was two accidents that he had two days in the row. I picked him up and I'm like, it, I just set him in the bathroom kind of a thing <laughs> that he had had in the middle of the night. And the third day, I find him in the bathroom sitting on the toilet. <laughs> what and he's like he's all proud of himself he's smiling and i'm like wow the sweetest it's just the best. just gotta melt your heart anything. i didn't have to go through you know oh my gosh use the potty here here's a treat because you went to you know all, all the hysterical things you hear from parents about potty training <laughs> well it's clearly the natural inclination that a child wants to do it's, yeah. it's kind of built in, you know, yeah. because we do it, you know, so it, it just seems to be like a uh, what would be a natural human um, evolutionary process of growing up. But we think that it has to, there's like, so this is so interesting that his brain is now being stimulated to coordinate with his body in a way that is very natural. Right. And then the mind part just really took off with him. He got um, obsessed with the phonics song. And that was literally, we got to the point where it was like, okay, he's a little hyper-focused on this phonics song because we had to play it every time we were in the car and we had to play it multiple times while we were in the car. And then to keep him happy, I found on YouTube, it's like Coco Melon and then there's another one. And it was nursery rhymes and he loved it because what they would do is they would sing these nursery rhymes with these cartoons and they put the words at the bottom of the screen and they'd highlight the words as they were going. Oh, so the colors and, and the, and the light would, would be very, they're, it was yeah. very stimulating to him yes. and he enjoyed it. And the next thing I know, he had taught himself to read. You know, I just watching the show. At four years old, he was reading and he could even spell. And the only reason that I figured that out is I needed something from Lowe's. I We pull into the parking lot. He looks up at the sign on the front of the store and says, L-O-W-E-S, Lowe's. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> what? What? Did he just read that? And he could he spelled it? <laughs> And he's if, four. Is he four at this at this he, time? He had just turned four. I was like, "Who is this kid?" I was just hoping to get back the child I had. Who is this one? <laughs> oh my goodness! But that's that's the thing. A lot of children that are autistic, if you can bring them out of their shell, they're intelligent. They're incredibly, incredibly gifted. I can and they see really that. Are. Mm -hmm. I think there's this um out of their head. There's this stigma because we don't understand it, right? Because there's there's communication is obviously a lot different, but mm -hmm. you can tell with autistic kids, there's so much going on in the mind. And you yes. can tell that they're so aware of so many things that there's gotta be a higher level of intelligence going yes. on. And I had this, I, I just a realization while you were talking about like the highlighted words and everything. And I'm thinking about how now on, you know, on TikTok, Instagram, um, you know, YouTube shorts, like we're using um, subtitles because most yeah. people watch videos without sound on and mm -hmm. that I'm now using, I just found this captions um, app that will do like a highlight, like you said, with your son and will yeah. highlight the word in a different color as it goes along that there must be something that also stimulates our minds that maybe unbeknownst to us that we're actually starting to move into a way that works better, but is what autistic kids naturally always were and maybe are kind of bringing us out that way. I don't know. There's it's something interesting. Like I just find that an interesting correlation. Well, in, in, in something that, that always um, fascinated me too is, you know, growing up, you, you, you get these books and I always love to read, but it's white paper with black writing. 
And yes, there's, there's a perfect contrast there so that you can see the words. Mm -hmm. But if you go out and you just look at the world and look at nature, what is black and white in nature? Nothing. It's colors. Yeah. It's all these colors. And that's what stimulates most people. And most people love blues or greens. That's their favorite colors. And if you look at it, you know, we have all this green and all then we have blue. all these blues. Oh, yes. All so stuff. true. The, the natural colors of the world are what we're most attracted to. Wow. That's very interesting correlation. I never thought about. And that means I'm going to be using a lot more blues and greens in my high life. <laughs> that, that's what the colors of the walls in my house. I have blues and green. Oh, that makes so much sense. So in his room, does he have a lot of color then or? Yes, he does. His room is blue, but there's a lot of uh, brightly colored things in his room. He loves the colors. And so now he's seven years old. Now he's seven. Yes. And he's reading at the level of an 11 year old mm -hmm. that blows my mind it blows my mind that simply through diet alone he was not only able to heal himself from what had happened in that episode but continue to heal himself beyond what he was before the episode even happened I, and actually yeah. give himself a greater chance of development. Yes. More so than some normal average kids in many ways. Yes. There, there's a lot, there's, there's a few times where, where he'll have a little bit of a situation. Maybe he'll get upset mm -hmm. or some anxiety and somebody will be working with him or whatever. And I'm like, he's just, this is autism that, and he's experiencing that. And they just kind of look at me he's autistic. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's actually autistic. Like, no, he's not. I'm like, yes, he actually is. If you could have seen what he was, you would know that that's what he is. And, and he can go back to that because he does get a hold of the wrong foods and he does revert. Mm -hmm. This is, this is really big. And I hope that a lot of my audience, if you know anyone who's got uh, with parents, with autistic children, anyone on the spectrum, I really would suggest sharing this video and this podcast um, with them, not because it's a guarantee that it's going to work, but mm -hmm. the younger that the child is introduced to this kind of diet as a possibility, you know, I think you've got to explore all options here. But if the way I see it is, I believe that autistic children are an incredible gift to our society. I think mm -hmm. they bring in a level of intelligence that we haven't been able to tap into. And then mm -hmm. if they're given the chance to develop properly through a, perhaps a healthier diet that is less carbohydrate, more animal protein based, that there's so much more we could learn from them in this lifetime. And they could go on to become incredible leaders in this world and teaching us many things. Yes. And, and, and yeah, it's, everybody's going to respond differently. And, and, and to me, it, even if it's not perfect, even, even if it does a little, something is better than nothing. A hundred percent. To me, taking fewer medications is better than what you were mm -hmm. taking a lower dose of a medication is better than what you were experiencing. If you just eliminate external irritations of symptoms you're going to see an improvement in just the general symptoms just improving the basic symptoms it's better than nothing anything is better any kind of improvement is worth it to the child's um quality of living yes mm -hmm. and, and and let's face it it's going to affect the quality of everyone else's living in the family you know I yes. mean, everyone benefits from that so, um, and I think what's really interesting here too, is that 
I am noticing through your story and your son, and then listening to other people, I've had numerous people reach out to me since doing this podcast um, with Dr. Anthony Shafee of all the different autoimmune diseases that have been healed, um, diabetes mm-hmm. reversed, like all these different things, digestive completely healed that, yeah. um, there's such a wide range of variety in how the body heals itself. And it, it's, it's almost like this really is food is your medicine. And, but we've always yes. been thought like it's plants that are our medicine, which they are, there are, there, there are plants oh, yeah. obviously are a medicine, but oh, yeah. also animal protein is as well. And I think we can't discredit that because it's clearly working for some people and for it to have such a wide range of impact. I mean, even people with anxiety, depression, like you said, manic depression, bipolar, Mm -hmm. like to know that that is getting healed as well. And so mental, mental disorders and, and um, issues are plaguing the world right now, given everything that we've been through. And I think a lot of people could benefit from possibly introducing even just a little bit more protein, animal protein into their diet and see how you feel. Um, and start there, you know, you don't have to go to one extreme from another or anything like that, but it's worth exploring if you're having Mm -hmm. some of these issues. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I've heard um, two different people kind of explain it a little differently and it depends on kind of which end of the spectrum you're on. Um, Dr. Mark Hyman uh, explained it as eat the foods that God made you not the foods that man made you. Mm -hmm. So eat what God gave you, not what man made you. And then Professor Barry Grove stated, human beings are the only species on the planet intelligent enough to make their own foods and stupid enough to eat them. (laughs) Oh, whichever spectrum you're on, go with it. (laughs) Yeah, that's very well said. Very well said. Well, I am so happy that you came on the show. I know we've gone over time already and I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate you sharing your story, your son's story um, with my audience because I just know it's going to help people. I really do. And I think, you know, to anyone who's really adamant about being vegetarian or vegan, like all the power to you. I send so much Mm -hmm. blessings to you on your journey and continue to do it. It's working for you. Great. But it's not going to work for everyone. Clearly, some people just really can't. And so we've got to have an open mind to all of the possibilities out there. And this is why I do the podcast so that we can explore all ranges. I explore all the things from commercial mainstream to total fringe stuff that is absolutely unbelievable. So why wouldn't we go there with diet as well? So Ali, thank you so much for being on the show. Is there anything that you would like to say as a final closing note to the audience? Just give it a try. Just find what, what heals you Mm -hmm. and stay with it. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's, and that's really, I think intuitively we just need to start listening to our bodies and take note of what's working, what's not working and um, gather more information. And once you find your sweet spot, great, stay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's such a pleasure. I'm so excited that, um, I love hearing stories like this and I really, I, to anyone in my audience, please, if you have success stories, drop them in the comments, email me, DM me, whatever it is. Um, if you're in the live stream right now, when this is premiering, just drop it in the live chat. Uh, We definitely want to hear from you because the more success stories that we have, the more people will be able to understand if it works, if it relates to them, it might help their journey. Guys, I love you so much and I'll be back with you next week. Thanks again for joining me for another show on the Enlighten Up podcast. I love you guys so much for all of your continued support. So remember to raise your vibe, find your tribe and be open to the infinite possibilities held in the mysteries that surround us all. Thanks again for sharing the show with your family and friends. And if you're new to the show and you need to find out more information about me, please head on over to my website, NicoleFrolic.com, where you can join my newsletter. And please follow me on Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Keep your light bright and I'll see you next week.